the Tesla Model 3. The goods, the bads. Is this car going to be the automotive disruptor that a lot of people think it's going to be? It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Welcome guys, welcome Money Guy family. This is your host Brian Preston sitting here with Bo Hanson. This is a special episode. A lot of you guys know we talk about personal finance. We talk about how to make your dollar stretch just a little bit further than your friends and peers. I picked up a brand new Model 3 about three weeks ago. This is my personal car and I just want to walk you through my experience. And I think that I have a different mindset. Let's face it, I'm a little kooky, a little a little? A little unique. So my perspective is a little different than a lot of other people out there. So I think we're going to have some angles. Even if you're not a Money Guy family member, we're hoping that you like how we interact, also learn something, right. and um, consider subscribing and joining the family. And then if you want more information, go to moneyguy.com. You can also connect with us on moneyguy.com with all of our so other social media channels like Twitter, Facebook, I mean, we try to really make it really easy to, to connect with us. So I want to jump right in. And here's what I think is going to be really great about, about this show, Brian, is that this will be part Tesla uh, Model 3 review. It'll be part auto industry change conversation. And then it's going to be part personal finance, too, talking about the implications of ownership if you are somebody thinking about making the jump to electric vehicles. That's exactly right. We're going to put the Money Guy flavor and talk about what it costs to own this car from the purchase perspective, the maintenance, as well as just what does it cost to keep this thing running? Because I think a lot of people are not familiar with this transition from fuel to an electric car. I want to talk about why this car is revolutionary. There's, there's really several key factors. First of all, this is a fun sports sedan. I didn't say sports car because we got four doors on this thing. You'll see, we, even though it has a, a very... It's a automobile. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, and it has a lot of room. It doesn't feel as big. A lot of people, when you go look at the Tesla Model S, a lot of people, when you say Tesla, they think of the first one, which is the Model S. That joker is a boat. I mean, I was even nervous because I test drove it twice. Didn't even know if it was going to fit in my garage because it's so much longer. This car is substantially shorter in length and size, but when you get inside of it, it doesn't it doesn't feel small. I mean, my previous car was a 12-year-old Lexus ES350, and um, that car, you call it a boat. Yeah. I mean, but this car feels smaller on the exterior, but the inside feels just as big as that as that former Lexus ES350 And did. for some context, Brian, both you and I are well over six feet tall, and we are sitting here in these two seats, and we're comfortable. We're not crammed, we're not on top of each other. Uh, so it, it is deceptively large on the inside, but it's not so large on the outside that it's not convenient to, to operate. The, the second thing that's really unique about this car is it's dripping with technology. Even a lot of the critics who have torn these cars apart and picked on some of the build quality and so forth, the one thing they cannot help but gush on is just the technology that goes into this car. And it's so different than your traditional auto manufacturers. And what makes it so different is that this car actually improves with age. I've had this car for three weeks and we've already had two updates. And what's amazing is I get just as giddy and as excited about an update in this Tesla as I do when the iPhone comes out with a brand new operating system because they really are trying to make the experience better and add additional upgrades the longer you drive this thing. So instead of most day, most cars, you buy it and then it immediately you start having remorse when they announce the brand new model and the brand new options. That's right. This car actually improves with age. That is unheard of. The long-term vision for Tesla is that they're going to have a more affordable version, a short range battery that's in the 200 mile range, okay. that, that, but the price point's going to be 35,000. When the price point is 35,000, when you take into account the maintenance savings as well as the fuel cost savings, I really do think this thing can swim downstream and start and this is gonna this is gonna sound odd. I think it can be competitive against even manufacturers like the Honda Accord, the Toyota Camry. And I, I know that is crazy because you say, wait a minute, this car, because it has sticker price on this car is it's fifty-seven thousand dollars because we have the autopilot sure. feature, we have the premium feature, um, you know, and we paid for the upgraded, you know, color, because if you want anything besides black, it's they charge you a little bit. And I've got the bigger rims. So this one is fifty-seven thousand dollars. But when they take it down to $35,000, I think that we might have some competition. Yeah. Without a doubt, wherever you feel about Tesla, it is undisputed that at a minimum, Tesla is forcing traditional auto manufacturers 
to really pick up their innovation. Oh, for sure. So I think yeah. all of us consumers have benefited by this competition that's going on with technology kind of being married to our daily drivers. Sure. I want to kind of now transition. Let's talk about some of the surprising things I noticed when I got this Tesla. And these are going to be the good side. And then I want to come back later and we'll talk about some of the things that are okay or not quite ready for prime time. We'll get into that. But, but overall, before I qualify everything, I want you to know this has been a great experience for me. I, I just, I went through, if you guys went on um, moneyguy.com, you'll see I have a car buying episode because I bought my wife um, a new car six months ago. Um, so I, I feel like I'm pretty fresh in sure. the car buying experience from traditional car buying experience to the Tesla car buying experience. So I think it's cool that we'll be able to give perspective on, on what's different from a traditional auto manufacturer. And what I think is beautiful, Brian, is I, I've kind of gotten to be a bystander watching you. You have put an immense amount of research and time reading through the forums, doing the analysis, trying to understand this automobile. I think it's so exciting that you're about to talk about things that you found surprising even though you kind of fully knew what to expect when you bought. So I think that's kind of a unique perspective on it. So first thing when people get in this, this Tesla, they go, where's the instrument cluster? How do I, how do I know? <laughs> because there's nothing when, you know, there is nothing in front of this. There's the steering, the steering wheel. wheel and then there's the dash. Yeah. And, um, and you'll notice when you get in, there's this huge, looks like an iPad Pro monitor sitting there. So Brent, I'm, I'm guessing, like I'm looking at this instrument panel and I see a lot of stuff that I'd recognize in a normal car. So am I safe to assume like this like dual climate control and if I want to, you know, cool off my side of the car, I just bump down the, the air right here? That's exactly right. And I think you're, what you're hitting on, and I want to talk about the, the climate control, but what's interesting is there's no buttons hardly anywhere except for the power windows and opening the door because everything is right here. Okay. And what's unique about the, the, the climate control is you can see it's all across the entire front of the car is a big vent. Sure. And I want to show you how this controls. We've got it on auto right now, but for just for purposes so you can see how this works, we're going to go ahead and kick it up. And you can see, look, you get to control. Oh. How, and if you wanted it on the center, you could bring it into one, and now wow. you just go up and down or over. You pinpoint, really pinpoint where you want it, or you go back to splitting it. And I could do the same thing over here on my side, oh, that's too. That's nuts. And, and you also, because of where the, 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 the screen is, the monitor, it all the controls, this monitor is so big, everything is about a third of the left side of the screen is all your operations type thing. That's where you're going to see your speed. That's where you go see, you know, what's going on around you on your blind spots and so forth. And that's where you go see all your wiper controls, your battery charge. So it, it becomes very intuitive very quickly. Sure. And then after a while, it doesn't bother you. But that's the first thing people notice is that there's no instrument cluster was it right there. Was it an adjustment at all moving from looking straight ahead to now looking a little to the center to see that sort of information? No, you know, and what's interesting, my wife's car has heads up display. And there was a lot of anybody who stalks the, the, the Tesla forum like I do, they know that there's a lot of discussion on heads up displays. And I will tell you it, that on, on my wife's car, it was very cool having the heads up display. But because of the monitor and its position right over the right side, out of the steering wheel, it's kind of like a heads up in the fact that it's it's right in your peripheral vision just naturally. So so that that's actually been surprising because I was nervous about not having anything in front of me. I thought I even before I got this car, I looked into getting some gizmos and um, and things to so I could strap my phone up on the dash because there's other you know YouTubers that have talked about that. I, I now think that would be unnecessary. Sure. Um, so, so I'm glad I, did, I didn't move in that direction. The next biggest thing, and this scared me in the beginning, but I got to tell you now after driving it for a few weeks, I am so disappointed when I drive my wife's car that it doesn't have this, is regenerative braking. This regenerative braking, if you guys don't know, we're here in Nashville, Tennessee, the North Franklin, Nashville, Tennessee, and there are hills everywhere. I mean, when you first move to this part, the first thing you realize is that instead of changing your brakes every five to six years, all of a sudden now you're changing your brakes every 18 months because your significant other doesn't realize you're not supposed to ride the brake pedal down a hill. Um, so this what a car, subtle little sick burn right there. <laughs> she doesn't watch. She doesn't watch the show, so it'll be okay. But it, what, what's interesting is that this car does the braking with the engine. I mean, it, it, and it's recharging the battery. It, hence the name regenerative sure. braking. You but notice how it's we're heat. going downhill. See how? Look how the regenerative braking. I'm not touching the brake pedal at all. The light's not on. 
this is just all my foot is off the gas, but you can see the brake is slow, the rege regenerative braking. And I noticed we're not accelerating at all. Mm -mm. Uh, it's keeping us at. Now I should say, see how the light's blue? Yeah. I do need to, I'm gonna hit the brake briefly because now you can really feel the brake because that had it, the smart cruise was engaged. Right. But I'll, I'll let it, even when I have my foot on the gas, see, you can see we're in the gas a little bit, but then I'll just take it off. Regenerative braking is doing all the work for us. This car, because you're letting the engine essentially charge the battery, you don't see much brake dust. And that's why there's a lot of people out there in the, the Tesla forums talking about you don't change brake pads on a, on a Tesla until the car has like over 100,000 miles on it, which is really? unheard of. But it makes sense when you drive this thing, you realize you don't really use your brake that much. So it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible in, the, in that aspect. Wow. Um, the next thing, which a lot of people are really curious about, is this autopilot. It's been all over the news because sure. there's been some yeah. unfortunate events that have occurred with autopilot. And, and I think I have a unique perspective because like I said, I just bought a brand new 2018 Audi for my wife and it has its own driver assistance package, which keeps you in the lanes, does the smart, you know, smart braking, the right. smart braking for cruise control, the lane, you know, the lane assist. It even has the headlight features, you know, with the, the cutting down the high beam. So I feel like I have a pretty good perspective and Audi is known for having one of the better technology sure. packages. So having a comparison between them and Tesla is very, very helpful and I gotta tell you and, and I don't say this lightly the Tesla autopilot feature is head and shoulders above what I have in my wife's Audi um, now I know a lot of people are gonna say well there's an a8 version that's supposedly the more that's the the big sedan that sure. Audi has that will drive itself has a, a little bit more functionality but I think that my wife's car still represents where Audi's at with their mass of cars that they've sent out sure. there and what this thing does differently is that the Audi, when I'm driving it and it doesn't like the lines because maybe the lines aren't that good in the road, it just bells on you. It just is like ding, ding, and then Grab gone. The I'm out, I'm out. You know, it just kind of taps out really quick. The, the Tesla, what, what's interesting about Tesla is that it not only is using the cameras, but it's also using the cars in front of you and, and, and making some assumptions. And so it doesn't just give up if the, if the lines in the road aren't perfect. Sure. And that's what I've, I've found really helpful is that this thing actually does a pretty good job. Now I tell you with a disclaimer is that I watch this thing like a hawk. I think anybody who thinks the term autopilot means that you truly can let the car just drive itself, Eh, it might be a little ambitious, but this is a pretty sharp curve. Yeah, this one scares me a little bit. Uh, Look at that! Oh my goodness! Oh, now wow. I'm getting nervous. Oh, oh, oh did you see that? Wow, it hit that it was though. an S. Oh, wow. it just did a full S that at 45 one, miles an that hour. One was, that one scared me a little bit. That's um, that's us being nervous. See how it's turning blue. Wow. We grab it. Whew. That, that one. That, that, that was a little. You? That was a little dicey. This one has a, this is another curve with a car. Oh, Ooh. and he crossed our lines. Oh my goodness. Ah. Okay, I'm taking over. Yeah, that's I mean, fun. we're still a ways away from the full autonomy of the car, you know, dropping you off at work and then going and picking you up a Starbucks and then getting its, you know, maintenance package done. We're not there, but it is pretty incredible that this car will, while you're sitting in traffic, especially while you're sitting in traffic, will do an outstanding job of keeping you in the lane, keeping you from the people, you know, from the car in front of sure. you. It, it just does awesome. It does curves really well. Truly impressed with how the autopilot feature works. The buying experience was unique. I mean, like I said, coming from buying an Audi just six months ago and now buying a Tesla, and I had a great Audi experience. I don't want anybody to th take anything away from, because y'all heard me talk about it in my, my show on car, car purchasing. And if you haven't listened to that, if you're thinking about buying a new car, go check out our tips on how to buy a new car, because we can make the experience better for you, for sure. For sure, because I mean, so moneyguy.com, but here's where Tesla's different. The majority of the experience was all on the internet. And I mean all on the internet. I ordered the car on the internet. I paid a $2,500 deposit on the internet to secure the order. And then I processed my, you know, if you're gonna pay cash or if you go do financing, that's all done through the internet. If you're gonna trade a car in, they actually make that through the internet. Here's how crazy it is if you're trading a car. You fill out the information, the, the VIN number on the car, you know, it's mileage and so forth. And then you actually take pictures at different angles that they want you to take pictures. You send it to Tesla. They then contact you and provide you what they will trade in the car for. So by the time you show up at the Tesla dealership, 
Everything is already done for you. It's just a matter of then you going and signing about five documents, sure. and then they spend the rest of the time just showing you how this cool gadget works. So you, you do, it really is different than anything else. There's no selling of extended warranties. There's no- You're not sitting there waiting for the sales manager and waiting for them to go get no, the paperwork. No, I mean, it, it's an instant process where you come in, sign a few documents, and then the rest of the experience is focused on, let me train you how to work this vehicle. The other thing that's kind of unique about this car is there's no cranking, there's no cutoff, and, and no locking necessary. Now it doesn't mean you can't do those things, you know, especially like the locking. You can manually do these things, but a lot of this stuff is done automatically to make your experience even easier. So like my, my wife's car has push to start. So you're talking about like this has like a push to start and you don't have to like crank the key. Is that what you're saying? I used to think, I remember that the, the, I, when crank the you know push button start was revolutionary and it truly was but this car is the next level because what you do when you get in the car you hit the brake pedal that kind of wakes it up you then on the stalk press either up for reverse down for drive you're rolling that's it i mean it is that simple and then when you get to where you're going you press this there's a button on the stalk that you press in that's park there's not actually putting anything into park you just press the button for park and then you physically get out of the car, it locks itself, you walk away. Wow. It's, I have left my wife's car on twice. And I am, I'm the type of guy who goes through checklists in my head. I don't ever leave car, keys in cars. I don't lock myself out right. of stuff, but I have almost left my wife's car running twice or forgot to crank it up because <laughs> it's just, you get used to it very quickly. Cause sure. like I said, we're three weeks in and I've already really gotten used to not having to do any of those, right. those normal everyday features. Technology package, as I've already mentioned, this car is dripping with technology. Even the haters acknowledge that this car has a lot of technology. So the first thing that happens when you get in this car that blows your mind, if you're an audiophile, I love, I was the kid that had, when I was 16, that had the $1,500 car with $2,000 worth of audio equipment. You get in this car and you're like, wait a minute, is that free? I didn't, I didn't have to pay for some sound package. I don't have to do a subscription to XM Sirius satellite to get that. No, currently every Tesla comes with slacker radio okay. and it's not the free version of slacker radio. It's actually like the upgraded plus version where it's unlimited skips. It's um, all these custom channels, no commercials. It's fabulous. We don't want to, we don't want to infringe upon anything with Foo Fighters, but if we wanted to turn up the volume, we just scroll the, the bar up or down for volume, and then if we hit right or left, it will actually go to the next track. So it's pretty cool that the the bar here is not, the scroll wheel, it does multiple functions. So Brian, you know, the cool thing about having a friend who has a cool car is they get the coolness of driving the car and having all the fun with it, but as a passenger, I get to control the radio. And yeah. full disclosure, I don't know how to do this, so I'm just gonna kinda. There's your favorites. Okay. And then, but you can take it all the way up. Now, if you want to just go streaming, here's all the slacker radio. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I'm going to go down here to favorites real quick, and I saw something that I was really interested. Oh, right here. Okay. So, this is the money guy now, show. Now, that's not slacker radio. You're jumping ahead. Okay. If you come up here and go to tune in. All right. There's all your podcasts yeah. that you can do and radio stations. So, this is not only slacker radio. It's not only your phone because there's integration with Bluetooth as well as USB with your phone, but there's also podcasts as well as traditional radio too. Navigation has been flawless. I'm a big Waze guy. I like Waze because I think Waze does a better job of routing you and concern, you know, whenever you have traffic or other things. This is flawless when you type in that you can use the voice command. And by the way, it still understands my Southern accent very well. Navigate to Destin, Florida. Look, I love how it shows you a Google yeah. Earth visual of where you're going. Now, surely we can't get to Destin without stopping. No so it's going to show us what we have to do. If this doesn't work, we're going to Disneyland. Well, for sure this is good. I would love to think that it could take us all the way to Destin, Florida, but it, it unfortunately can't. So you can see it wants us to navigate down if we started the trip. It's gonna have a stop at Birmingham, Alabama with 28% battery life left. We'll charge for 25 minutes. Okay. And we'll do that at 2.38 p.m. And then we'll keep you know, driving further, get to Greenville, Alabama, charge for another 25 minutes. And by the time we reach to Destin, it will be 19% battery life. How intuitive, because it doesn't want you to fill up for an hour 
at Birmingham, it recognizes that, you know, breaks it. So it's going to have you stop twice instead of just stopping once and filling up the whole time, yeah. right? Yeah, because it knows that it's going to build it off of when it thinks you need potty breaks or food. It's, it's a pretty intuitive and smart feature. And what I like about the navigation, you know, even my complaint with Waze is, is that it only shows the next turn, right. you know, so you don't know if you should be in the far right lane, the left lane, because it's only showing you your next turn. Because the screen is so big in this, and you have this beautiful Google Earth where you're looking down, you can tell if your neighbors have swimming pools, you can sure. see what's going on. It shows you your next three to four turns, and it also does a great job of telling you which lanes to get into. Yeah. Very, very happy, and the new, the new traffic overlay update that Tesla did recently has been superb. I've actually ran Waze and the Tesla navigation side by side. They were pretty close to being spot on with each other. The only thing you don't get with the Tesla navigation is that the Waze does is you don't get to report the potholes, you don't okay. get to report the, um, the, the police the officers, the, the car, some of that safety stuff. I would love to see that functionality sure. added, but at, at a minimum, because it's integrated into the car, this is actually a navigation system I think you'll actually use. Whereas um, even my wife's brand new Audi, I don't use the navigation in it because I'll be honest, it's kind of clunky. Yeah, it's hard to get it's hard to get the address into it, and then it's um, Waze is superior to it. Sure. And so I think that, that this is actually something that I will continue to use, and that's a compliment to the navigation system. Um, there's a few other cool gadget factors I want to talk about on the technology. We have self parking. Okay. This car will either pull you into a parking spot or it will parallel park you into a parking spot. That's kind of a cool feature. Sure. You don't see that on a, on a ton of cars. It's also got a really awesome app. Um, it, this app, you know, a lot of cars will do self start. Mm -hmm. So you can heat and cool them if you know if it's really cold outside right. or really hot outside. But this is not you just, have to be in a you have to be distance. in a range. You know, yeah. you find yourself holding your, your key fob under your teeth, trying to see if you, maybe you're holding tenfold, trying to see <laughs> if you can get a better signal. It's not that way. Since this is actually going off the built-in LTE service that Tesla puts in all their cars, um, and then using your, whatever, you, you know, Wi-Fi or cellular that you're on your phone, you can control the, you know, the temperature in the car, you can control the horn, the alarm, windows, all the controls that you could while you're sitting in the car. So you're saying that like on a, let's say on a Saturday, you're at a football game, I don't know, like a University of Georgia football game and your car is parked way somewhere else on campus, you could be sitting in the stadium about to get out, you could control the temperature right there from yep. the stadium and get to your car and it's cool and ready for you to ride. And you know where the car is at all times. I mean, it doesn't matter where it is, it shows up on the app. Um, you can also en enable the valet control. So if you get into a restaurant and realize, oh no, I didn't enable the valet, I'm worried that somebody could do some. What do uh, valet controls do? Click on here and see how it says valet mode. Yeah. Now I've already set up my passcode, so it's asking for it. But sure. it, so when I type in the passcode, it disables it, or I could disable it with the app. And so go over again. What what all does valet mode limit? So we're in valet mode right now. See how it says valet? Uh -huh. Normally to open the glove box. By the way, I didn't talk. Most most videos are going to show you how cool. We'll do it. Oh, look! There's the glove box. That's how you open the glove box. Notice it's not working. Okay. You have to have the code in. Because I don't want to show everybody in America my code, I'll do it. Um, I'll do it through my app. See, I just took it out of LA mode. Now right. it immediately starts with changing settings and stuff. But watch this. There's the. Now nice. the glove box opens right that. up. What Tesla does, and I don't completely trust it all the way, but I do use half of the functionality. It has HomeLink, but it has HomeLink where it's smart enough that when you pull within 70 feet of your garage. It can open your garage automatically, okay. and then it can do the exact same thing when you leave your house. It will close your garage for you. Now, here's what I've done. Is I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a forum stalker for the Tesla forum. I have enabled the automatic open. So when I pull up in the evening, it, it does this beautiful little chime, and then it pops the garage door open. Love it. I do not, I have not enabled the automatic close. I'm so scared because I don't think it's so smart that it knows up or down. Yeah. I think it just is going off of, so if the door was open or closed and you did it, you, you could cause some some stress for yourself. Sure. So I'm using half of that, but I still think it's pretty cool and a step in the right direction that they're thinking about, hey, how do we make the home link 
even more functional sure. than just the, the having a button that's already integrated into your system. That's awesome. Oh, one last thing before we close out on the technology. There's two cool things that this thing has besides just how you, you do all the controls to set your mirrors. Um, you know, you can even control the headlights, but there's, there's two fun functions called creep and hold. Um, you know, I'd previously talked about, I know, creep, it makes you think like, talking about stalkers, yeah, yeah. you know, maybe bad boyfriend, like, you know, what's creep, man? but um, it, it's, it's kind of intuitive once you hear about it is that I've already talked about the regenerative braking. Um, so that, that's a cool thing, but a lot of people have trouble when they, when they get in a, an electric car and they're so used to the car when you take your foot off the brake that the car pulls forward a little bit, you know, there's a little pressure yeah. from the engine to move the car forward. You can fake that with the Tesla by turning on creep mode, meaning that it will push the car forward. Really? I actually, I was trying to be all adoptive of all new technology on this car, so I actually did not enable creep. I ended up having to come back and enable it because the problem I was having, because we are so hilly around here, with creep on, when you take your foot off the brake, it will roll back. And oh. that, that kind of gave me some pause, so I enabled creep, but I thought that was really cool that they've tried to make a, and the experience of an electric car where if you can't get away from some traditional things you're used to, they've, they've essentially faked it for you, sure. so that's cool. And then there's also a hold feature on the braking system, meaning that if you're um, at a stoplight or on the side of a hill, you just push a little harder on your brake pedal and it puts it in hold. You'll see it all very clearly on the display. And then when you either hit the gas, it just automatically disengages and takes you forward. So it's just kind of, th these are some of the cool factors that Tesla has integrated into the technology just to make your driving experience a little bit better. So a lot of you are probably watching and you're like, okay, but here's the problem with your electric car. There's not a gas station that you can go to. Or maybe I live in a part of the country where, you know, it's not like, super convenient. I got a supercharger at the local Whole Foods There's a lot of people, and this is the part where I think we're all going to have to think about this, is there's a lot of what they call range anxiety, that people are worried. You're going to get an electric car, you're going to get to where you can't charge it, and you get stuck. And um, So I want to challenge you on a few things. First off, this car for me has been incredible in the fact that it, I, I have a charger in my house, and we'll talk about the... It, I, I Originally, when I built the house, I was fortunate enough that I put a, 14, a NEMA 1450, looks like a, a dryer oh, the, plug. Yeah, it looks like a dryer plug. Well, it looks like a dryer plug. Like what you plug your, your, your dryer in your, your house in. I had one of those put in the garage because I kind of had a clue that I might do an electric car someday. And um, that's been great because I can charge the car from the house. So every morning when I get in the car, it's like having a filled up tank of gas. So is that, so, that going to make your electric bill like go through the roof? No, and I, I'm going to get into in the economics in a minute, but it does make it nice from convenience the fact that I, every morning when I get in the car, so there's never a fill-up moment. So then a lot of people, because everyone I talk about this, they go, man, it's great around town, but you're probably, if you ever want to go on a trip... you got to take the wise car, I'm you, sure. You're, you're stuck because it, you're going to spend a lot more time on the trip having to go by a supercharger, finding... A, so by the way, if you don't know, superchargers, because I'm assuming we have a lot of listeners that probably aren't Tesla people. Tesla's doing something pretty unique in the fact that they're creating their own supercharger network. So in, in terms, it's like their, their own network of gas stations sure. for, electric, for all the electric cars that they have. So I, I think a lot of people but that, have, that are concerned about range anxiety, there is a counterpoint though. I know when I have to go get gas for my wife every week, because it's kind of a courtesy sure. that I do in our relationship, it takes about 30 minutes because I'm a tight wad and I go out to Costco because their right. gas is 60 cents cheaper a gallon than everybody else around here. It is easily that 30 minutes. Sure. So if you think about every week I'm spending 30 minutes taking my wife's car to, to, to fill up, there's an argument to be made. Two hours a month, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, there's an argument to be made that that extra time that you'd have to do on a trip to do 20 minutes or 30 minutes at the supercharger, that it's okay because I made that back up throughout the year. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people, if you're curious, a supercharger will add about 170 miles in 30 minutes. I don't even know, I don't, where, I don't even know where, the, where the gas lid is. See oh, how wow. smart yeah. and new. We plug it in. Now, you have a little green, green um, Tesla okay. logo here. Because it's green, that means it's getting charged. Right. Now it's kind of reading, you know, it, supercharger is talking to the Tesla. When it starts taking, and realize the car is pretty full right now, 
it will start showing, it'll show you how but, fast it's actually sucking so down the electricity. So I didn't see you swipe a credit card or anything like that. How, These things are smart, they know each other. I mean, so Model 3s are not free like the Model S's and X's are, but it's keeping a running tab that I, you know, can pay through the Tesla okay, Direct. So, they, so when you fill up your car, you're running a tab right now. Yeah, I'm right. running a tab. It's really cheap. I mean, I added a pretty good amount of, of distance last time I used one of these and it cost me $2. Wow. So I did, I, I had the, the NEMA 1450 in my garage, but I did go ahead because they had an inventory the day I picked up. I put a full Tesla charger in my house. I, I'm happy to report that it actually did a 50% pickup. The, just putting the, the, the 1450 in the house was 30 miles per hour charge rate okay. if, you just on your, if you just had the NEMA 1450. Yeah. But if you add the Tesla charger, it takes you up to 45 miles wow. per hour. So it charges pretty quickly. And once again, the app is so smart that after you plug it in at night, it tells you, hey, trays fully charged or trays charged. And by the way, you don't usually charge 100%. For today's recording, I took it all the way up to 100%. I mean, the mile, mileage is in range is about 314 miles. But daily, I take it up to about 250 or about 70 to 80% of the battery because that's just better for the long term but, battery. And I don't know if this technology has changed, Brian, but I know like uh, a lot of people, and I'm one of those people, I get nervous about leaving my phone charged up overnight because I hear if you overcharge it, then the battery life will start to die. If you're plugging in your car every night before you go to bed and letting it charge all night, are you not going to like really decrease the life of your battery by leaving it charged, pl plugged in that whole time? Well, that's why this thing is so smart is that it lets you tell the how far and how much of the battery you want to charge. And that's why you can set it to 70, 80 percent. You can even set it if you live in a community that has lower electricity rates at night like i know georgia has that feature um, they do not in tennessee i researched it come on tennessee let's work on that <laughs> you can actually program your car to charge like at one in the morning so you can take advantage of okay. the cheapest rates possible so charge at one in the morning take you to 80 percent and then just stop yeah even if it's still so plugged you're not in. loading up the battery and causing long-term damage and that's probably a great point for me to mention that the battery because a lot of people probably have some concern it's 84 i mean it's eight years 120,000 miles is the warranty okay. on the battery, and they, they call it their drive unit. So I guess that's the, the motor, you right, know. Right, right, right. You know, so it's um pretty good. And then if you want to know the other, the rest of the the warranty, it's four years, 50,000 miles for bumper to bumper okay. stuff, just like a normal car would be. All right, so Brian, so okay, so it's amazing. We love it. It's awesome, but it can't be all sunshine and rainbows. There have to be some warts. So since now that you are a Tesla owner. Give us the real scoop that we're not going to see in the advertising and in the people that are excited about it. What are, what's, what are the real negatives about the automobile? Nothing I'm going to share here takes away that I'm, I'm ready to not have this car okay. anymore. Because I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, I'm trashing my car, but I am going to be honest with you. And I feel a little guilty because I'm about to show you. So this is a beautiful car, but I'm going to show you a few things that if you ever see me out and be like, or you see it in the parking lot, you go, oh, there it is. He, he showed me. So I'm about to show you. It's kind of like, you know, pointing out the ugly parts of your girlfriend or your wife, which is which highly don't ever, don't inappropriate. Don't but but for, for you guys and the Money Guy family, I'm going to share some things. Okay. So the first thing that I've already had to rescue, here, here let me go ahead and give you the, the casualty list. A valet driver, um, a school teacher, because I went and picked up my daughter yesterday from school and the school teacher could not figure out how to get my daughter in the car. I had to do this. I look like an acrobatic trying to get back there to hit the button to open up the back door is the door handles are kind of unique in this car. They look beautiful. I mean, from an airflow and aerodynamics, I'm sure it's outstanding. But when people walk up to this car who are not familiar with Tesla, who haven't read the forums, they don't know how to get into this thing. So the it's door, um, open. Yeah, I mean, it's because um, they're counting on, like on all the other Teslas, the door handle kind of comes out and then it's a traditional handle that you pull. These you have to push at the back. It pulls the lever out, kind of like a suicide handle, and then you pull it and it releases it. Um, it, it, it you get used to it very quickly if you own it, but there's going to be a learning curve for everybody that's not part of the Tesla family. So that's that, that the, the, the ins and outs is a little weird. And then also realize everything's electric in this car. So the way you get out of a Tesla is there's buttons on all the top of the door handles, but Tesla was smart enough. They said, well, wait a minute, the battery might not always work. We got to make sure people can still get out of the car. Sure. So they put an emergency release handle in here. But okay. the problem is, it's exactly where it would be for anybody who's had a normal car. So you look at, if you sit in this car, it's right above where the power windows are. There's a oh, tendency yeah, that I mean, passengers want to pull the handle 
And, and that's, you're like, well, that's not a big deal. But yes, it is a big deal because it even tells you when you pull that handle on the screen, it warns you, it's like, don't do this very often because you'll notice when you open the door in this car, the windows come down. I don't know if it's a half an inch, but they come down because they're trying to protect the trim oh, yeah. and, the, and the, the seal that's around the door. So if you pull that emergency handle, it doesn't give the motor enough time to lower the window to let you out. Sure. So every time somebody gets in my car, I feel like I'm giving a tutorial 101 on how to get in and out of my car. That's going to take some getting used sure. to. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, those are nitpicks, but it is something that, that I think people should know. The next thing, we're all used to blinkers. I look like a person that doesn't know where I'm going. So I'm gonna do a slight blinker. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do a full one. I'm just gonna push it up slightly. See, so it right. gives us two, thing three, right there. there you go. Three flashes and then it was out. So we'll do it again, three flashes, then we're out. Now, if we wanna go longer, I push it all the way up. That's a hold. It will hold until we turn the steering wheel. Okay. So we're at a stoplight. Oh, look, so there's it's a car. Gonna hold. It shows you the oh, car. Oh, it does right show the, front, the car. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is when we're multiple deep, that looks it, like it a Tesla usually will show. Yeah, it shows a Model X. That's nice. Um, so we're going to turn and it cuts off. But I've gotten better at this. A brand new person who didn't realize that there's two th different thresholds with the blinker, you start looking a little crazy because maybe you want to just go in the left lane here. So you push it accidentally down hard. Right. So you're, you get in the left lane, you, you, oh, but the, like, but the thing's like, still going. So then like you, you push it right to cut it, cancel. Oh, and it's on again. Oh no. So you have to learn the difference between pushing hard, pushing soft yeah. and the, the subtleties of it. And when you're first getting used to a car, cause you're used to a, when you put it in the turn singer signal, it locks into position. Right. This always comes to center. So you need to know just the difference. Now, I think over time I will grow to like this, but the first three weeks, it was a challenge getting used to it. And probably just because I didn't realize there was a difference. Right. Another little thing I've noticed about the, the Model 3 is that it has this big display that when you put it in reverse, a good two thirds of the screen turns into your rear camera. Sure. Unfortunately, if you do anything like mess with the radio or I say radio, that's so traditional. If I just turn on slacker radio or, or do any other controls, it takes away the camera. So if you put it in reverse, which all you do to that is just click the knob but, up. And now we have the radio pause. We're on the Foo Fighters radio, of course. But what if all of a sudden I, I didn't like the music, so I, I hit this. Uh-oh. Even though we're in reverse, you can see the camera, the camera is completely go? gone. So put it in park, put it in reverse, and then take a follow a mental note. Brian, don't do anything until you get reverse. So there's not a way to get the camera back. Well, I mean, I put it in reverse, put it in park, and put it back in okay. reverse. But I couldn't like X out, and all of a sudden, get back. It to came back. I've had several situations where I've gotten Bluetooth phone calls from people. You know, say there were solicitations or whatever, phone numbers I didn't recognize, so I, I deferred it and did not take it. And then there's been some some clicking sound within the radio to the point that I've had to reboot the the display about three times no, so, there's, no, that, so there's a little bit of there so you're driving the car you get a phone call you decline it it freezes up is that like a big not, safety not, no it doesn't freeze there's been no safety concerns it's more of just an inconvenience of the radio had this clicking sound or it becomes like there was some conflict between the bluetooth convert you know because it you're listening to the music and then all of a sudden the bluetooth tries to take over trying to give it back to the music seems to be some type of software glitch. But you said you had to reboot. So is that annoying? Yeah. You had to pull over, turn the car now, off? Now, here's the cool thing. You don't have to, this is what I think is, is shows that they've really put some thought into this. When you get to the next stop sign, stop light, all you do to reboot the display is you put your foot on the brake and then you hold down the, um, the, the center console buttons the center, steering wheel buttons, the system will reboot itself. But here's the cool thing. The car still works. Like you can still drive. Okay, so, so I've done this at stoplights and, and no, had no trouble because the okay. car will still operate and you'll see that the, the display turns itself right back sure. on. Music picks up as soon as it gets it catches its LTE signal. So it's, it's, it's more of just an inconvenience. And it's no different than I know whenever my, my iPhone gets a new update, Sometimes you have to reboot the system right. so that all the glitches and bugs and everything get out. Since this is so much driven by software, I think it's just gonna be a new norm with the automobiles that you do have to reboot them from time to time just because they have so much technology yeah, built into sure. them. The other thing that um, I've gotten used to on other cars is when you have blind spot detection, which 
Tesla has blind spot detection. It's just that it shows up here on your little cartoon of the vehicle. You'll see if something's in your left or right. Okay. Um, but that's not intuitive to the way we all drive. When we drive, we typically, if we're going to, to transition to the left lane, we'll look over our left shoulder. So it's convenient if there's a sensor right here on your mirror that says, hey, there's a car there or a car there that makes sense it doesn't make sense that i don't have blind spot detection in the mirrors I, I wish that it had that we also don't have we have all these seats that are heated i mean you even have all the back row is heated seats including the center the center section which i don't know who wants to sit in the center seat but they have a heated center seat but there's no ventilated seats which down here in the south ventilated seats are kind of a a, you know nice sure. thing to have yep. if, if you're talking about luxury vehicles and then i think uh, something you have seen a lot in the press is is fit and finish there have been some things that are brand new auto manufacturer this is their first take into trying to build a, a lot of quantity of vehicles sure. really mass producing and and they're tr the, the, it's it's improving very rapidly like right. it's just like this car the, the the drive is awesome on but the first ones that came off the assembly line they this the stiffness was supposedly too strong so they they put softer springs in sure. it but there's also fit and finish in the fact that this is if you go on any of the forums you'll notice right here by, on the on the front pillars in front of the steering wheel and the display of the dash there's a little bit of a bulge in the trim piece uh, now that i've shown oh. you this you're like wait wait a minute I, there, I would, there is yeah you, ten thousand years i would have but never that's a that. known thing also you'll see on the back on the trunk lid the left side's a little different than the right side on the fit and finish of the truck lid. And then one of the things that, that surprised me on this car is right here, this thing has this beautiful panoramic glass roof, and then it's got a huge windshield. So you're surrounded in glass. Well, it looks like whenever they were installing my front windshield, there was a little adhesive that got on the underside right in the black trim, and you can see it. You can see that there's a strip of glue that shouldn't have been there, right. that got there in the manufacturing process, and I don't think there's a way to fix that. So fit and finish, I mean, this is a new auto manufacturer doing mass um, building. They they got some, some, some growing out. pains yeah. that they're working through, but overall, I think it's pretty good. And then here's the last thing that I'll, that I'll pick on is that I'm 6'3". I used to tell people I was 6'4", but I think now that I'm You're over my 40s, I'm shrinking yeah. a little bit, still taller than Bo. Not even close. But, but here's the thing about the car. When you pop the trunk, and now, Model S and Model X have power lift gates. And this has a, this is not, this is a trunk. It's, it's not a, a hatchback, this is okay. actually a trunk. But when you pop it and it opens up, it's high. I mean, I will tell you, it's, it's a stretch for me to reach up and there's some resistance to push the trunk closed. So close I think a smaller person um, is going to have some trouble with cl opening and sure. closing the trunk. So that's just something that, that would be nice if, if they had They have the that. auto button where you can push no, it and it's it comes not, down? It's all very much just manual. You okay. pull it, there's a handle that you can grab, but it's just kind of an awkward pull sure. um, to open and close the trunk. It's okay for me, but I think that um, people who are, like I said, who are not as big right. might have some, some issues with that. Sure. One last thing, this is, this is truly a nitpick. But this is what's awesome about the Tesla. It has cameras everywhere. I mean, I think we have a few cameras up here right above the rearview mirror. We also have cameras in the front pillar above by the front tire. We have pillars right here where you open the door and the side pillars. We have cameras in the back. We have all these cameras, but the only camera you actually get to see is your rear view camera. I don't understand with all these cameras why we can't do the cool aerial view oh, yeah. Yeah. like you see in Audis, you see them in Nissans, where it looks like you have your own little drone that's kind of hovering above the car showing you when you're parking sure. how close you are to things. That's not in this vehicle, and I don't understand why. Seems why don't we get an aerial easy. vision, but we have this huge, beautiful monitor. We have all these cameras. It seems like we have all the recipe ingredients to make something happen. It's just the chef, Mr. Musk, has not put it in made it available to us. So Elon, if you're listening, which I'm sure he is, aerial view would be outstanding. Plus cool factor. Can you imagine when you have your friends in here and you're showing and it looks like you're parking? Cause that's always a, a big sizzle moment when I show people that in my wife's car. Yeah. So it's a, that would be a cool feature that they could definitely add to the Tesla. So let's cover what Money Guy listeners are expecting. Let's talk about the economics of owning a okay. Tesla. Cause this is the part where you're like, 
Here's what Brian is an expert at. Let's see if he can give us some flavor to sure. actually tell us what is it like to own a Tesla. The first thing, I want to talk about the purchase of the Tesla and the fact of what it costs. This car is $57,000. So it's not it's not an inexpensive car it's not in its current form. Because realize it starts with $35,000, but then they add, you know, like $9,000 for the long range battery. If you want to have all the automated driving features of autopilot, that's like $5,000. So there's all these features, and then if you want some, you know, if you want anything besides black on the color, if you want bigger wheels and bigger hubcaps, because sure. um, this actually has rims, whereas if you buy the 18-inch rims, it's, they're hubcaps, hub and it kind of bothered me. I never could get over the look of them, um, but it pushes this car up to $57,000. Now, right now, there is a $7,500 tax credit okay um, now the way this tax credit works with the federal government is that when up until they hit 200,000 cars manufactured over the next two following quarters it's going to be a drawdown of that credit it goes from 7500 to 3750 essentially goes in half okay. so I'm, I'm you know there's a lot of speculation out there because we're getting close to 200,000 cars it's either going to happen this quarter which is second quarter of 2018 okay. or it's going to happen in the the third quarter so a lot of people are wondering will Elon and Tesla game the system and even if they're getting close to 200,000 maybe shift some of the money up cars up to Canada because right. it's 200,000 in the United States to extend that credit but there is a $7,500 credit but that's probably going away at some point in the future so when the more affordable version comes out the 35,000 probably not going to be a tax credit out there sure. unless they've um somehow Extended convinced the government to, to to extend this thing so that's how much the current cost is so like I, I mentioned earlier this is probably great competition currently and should gobble up a lot of market share from mid-size luxury brands I don't think it's mainstream yet because fifty seven thousand dollars is still an expensive, expensive car sedan, yeah. at that point I think when it gets to thirty five thousand now we might be getting to some sure. something that's a little more competitive with mainstream. Um, so let's talk about the cost of electricity, because if the purchase price is high, is there a way we can make this thing up through maintenance or, or cost of electricity? This was the most shocking thing, because I think if you ask the man on the street, I mean, Bo, before you knew about my Tesla experience, do you know, is gas cheaper or electricity? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, did I, you have any idea? I didn't have it. I, I said it'd be a trade-off. Okay, you're not going to the gas station. You're not putting, you know, unleaded fuel in your automobile. But man, if you're charging at your house or if you have to stop at one of these crazy fill-up stations, I was thinking, okay, it's going to be forty dollars in electricity to fill up instead of forty dollars in gas that's kind of what i thought was going to happen Yeah, because a car costs 30 to 40 maybe even 50 dollars if you have an suv sure. maybe even more with gas fuel prices going up but that's what i kind of thought it was the same thing but actually electricity is substantially cheaper than what you're paying at the pump and let me give you and i actually used real world i'm nerdy enough that i went and pulled my own electricity rates okay i went and pulled what the rates were i mean what gas per gallon was in the area and i looked at cars and here's where we are so if we think about this in terms of what does it cost to go 100 miles in this car, you first need to figure out, well, how much power is this car going to pull? It's going to pull approximately 20, 23.7 kilowatts to go 100 miles. Okay. A kilowatt, you're probably wondering, well, how much does that cost? I pulled my electric bill, and I'm sure there's probably some infrastructure and other costs, but I said, you know what, we're going to keep this simple, just right. take my power bill, divide it by how many kilowatts, and I figured out how much a kilowatt was per hour, and it was 0.148, so almost 15 cents okay. for a kilowatt. So if you multiply 23.7 by the 14.8, it's $3.50 to go 100 miles. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. So you think about that, a car, you typically drive a car for 15,000 miles a year. You okay. think that's pretty reasonable, yeah, 15,000 right. miles? Yeah. So to go 15,000 miles in a Tesla, it's gonna cost you right around $526 per year in electricity if you think about a car because i said let's be fair about this and let's talk about this let's assume down the road when we have a thirty-five thousand dollar version of tesla we probably could compete then with the honda accords the sure. i mean the toyota camrys those cars easily get a average around 30 miles a gallon okay so the cost to go 30 miles a gallon 15,000 miles a year is going to be approximately a little over fifteen hundred dollars a year Okay. So you are saving a thousand dollars. Right now, where Tesla is currently positioned, it's more to compete against luxury auto manufacturers. Well, we all know luxury cars require 
high grade premium right. fuel and they also usually don't get as good of gas mileage right. so i went and pulled a um, 5 series bmw a 5 series bmw gets about 24 miles the gallon on average and it requires high grade fuel so that is going to push your annual fuel cost over 2000 actually close to 2100 okay. a year so you can quickly see that the higher you go up on the food chain of cars the savings per year on fuel right. gets better so right. against the bmw this car saves you about fifteen hundred dollars wow. a year in fuel costs let's talk about ongoing costs a lot of you guys are going yeah but what does it cost to keep a tesla going now the the, the whole innovation thing about an electric car is instead of thousands of parts this car has hundreds of parts okay. because there's just not as many moving parts in an electric car like there are in your traditional automobile. So that's good in the long term, but still Tesla wants you to do some, some maintenance, maintenance on this. Now, the, the thing is a Model 3 is so new on the market, Tesla has not announced what their maintenance plan is going to cost because they end up with the Model S and the Model X, they've offered annual maintenance plans that you could prepay for and they, they would essentially cover your maintenance costs for the first four to five years of ownership. Okay. They have not announced any program like that for the, the, the Tesla, for the Model 3, but um, I think we could at least look at the Model S maintenance plan and get a clue for what's going to be required for the Model 3. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you, and I have the numbers right here. Year one of owning a rear wheel drive Model S is going to cost you $475 if you want to prepay it with Tesla. Okay. So what does that get you? And Because when I saw it, I was like, $475, that's less than $500, but still, I want it to be as close to free as sure, possible. And what is, how is this compare and contrast to a traditional automobile? So here's what you get in year one is key fob battery replacement. Well, that's not needed on a Model 3. What's interesting about a Model 3, and I'm going to show it to the camera right now, is that your key is actually this card. It looks like a hotel room key. Um, and if you need to replace it, it's less than $10. That's pretty cool. That's so pretty, you go try to replace your key um, from any other car and it's gonna be hundreds of dollars. This one costs you less than 10, but really your key is your phone. So there's no key fob battery replacement. The next thing, and this is the secret sauce, is they say the Tesla multi-point inspection. I have no idea what the multi-point inspection is, but that's probably what the majority of that $475 is going for. And by the way, if you don't do this treatment or this maintenance plan, it still doesn't void your warranty. So this is just okay. suggested or optional. So is there any special tech tech on the tires or are these just normal automobile tires? No, these are, these are normal tires. I don't think they'll be that expensive to replace them. They're not like a normal, if you buy a Porsche, right. you, know, you about pay an arm and a leg for it. But you, one of the cool features is that it does have the tire sensors though, so you can okay, see yeah. you know, what the, how your air pressure is. You got a trip computer, here's your windshield wipers, okay. which is auto by the way, so you don't have to really do anything. It does a pretty good job on the, um, on the windshield wipers as well. The next thing is tire rotation. Well, guess what? All cars need a tire That's rotation. Right. Wheel alignment check. Guess what? All, All cars, cars need yeah. wheel alignment. And then the last thing is wiper blade set replacement. Well, we know wiper blades don't cost $475. So like I said, it must be in that multi-point inspection. Okay. Year two, 725 for a Model S Tesla. It's everything that's in year one, but um, they also add an AC, say that word, Bo, uh, desiccant. Desiccant bag replacement. Yeah, desiccant bag replacement. Have no idea what that means. It sounds like it's something dirty that the air conditioner is putting out. Brake fluid replacement, which once again, we're probably having to do that. Cabin air filter replacement, that's in most luxury that's cars right. these days. Year three is the same as year one, so it's 475. And year four is $850, because it's the same as year two, but they add also a battery coolant replacement because okay. you want to make sure probably halfway point that they're they're taking care of those batteries so overall as you can see a lot of that stuff i don't think is Additional that crazy that yeah. different than what you do with a traditional combustible engine car so maintenance is not going to be substantially more and there's a lot of indication because it's much easier to replace a bat i mean an engine a motor it's not really an engine it's more of a motor in an electric car than there is 
with um, having to replace a full engine with all those moving parts in a normal traditional car. So would you say that the maintenance cost is actually probably less for an electric car, you know, based on those numbers that we just did, than it would be for an in internal oh, for sure. combustible engine? Especially a luxury car manufacturer, because the, the, like if you go look at a BMW, BMW usually gives you your first two years of service. I think the reason they have to do that is because if you knew what you were going to be paying for service, you wouldn't buy the car. <laughs> so they just give you, build it into the price and give you the first two years, because year three, I mean, maintenance costs can easily be fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars sure. a year um, because of some of the things they're requiring on these higher end cars so that's definitely something to, to, to be mindful of um, and then a, another thing that I think that what you worry about with owning an electric car is is the technology going to change so fast that that outdates it okay. and that's why I do think it's interesting that 80 percent of electric vehicles according to some research I saw are leased okay. unfortunately the model 3 Tesla is not making the model 3 eligible for leases at the moment you have to fully purchase this car so I think that the only fear I have is is the hardware going to change on these vehicles we know the software automatically updates right. but is the hardware going to change to the point that this car is outdated quickly just like buying a computer many years ago when the cycle of battery technology as well as just the electronics in here the cameras the sensors is that stuff going to become outdated too sure. soon? That is a risk and I have some fears about that but um, I was so excited that it, it seemed like it made sense to go ahead and make the jump and do this. Plus my car was 12 years old. I wanted to kind of use this opportunity now to talk about how is this different than buying a traditional car? Are there some guidelines for purchasing? And Bo, you'd be great on this because this ties back into what we did six months ago buying my wife's car is because people have a tendency, they feel like they're part of a movement when you're buying a Tesla, you know you're on the front end of something. Mm -hmm. So that's causing some people to make some behavioral decisions that I don't think are normal. Yeah. Um, I, I, I go on these Tesla forums and people are talking about how do I finance, how do I afford this Tesla, I really want this Tesla. And, and you see people talking about 84 months. And that, that gives me heartburn, guys. When I hear about people having a car payment for seven years on something that I just told you has potential that it could become obsolete right. if they change certain things within this car. So I give you the same guidelines I give you with any car. This car should be paid for within three years. If you cannot afford, from a cash flow perspective, to have this car paid for within three years, Might you, sh you shouldn't buy it. Because realize, if $50,000 is too much right now, maybe you should just be patient and wait mm -hmm. for the, the more affordable $35,000 version that sure. will be coming down the pipe. And I think it's really important. You have to kind of know yourself because it becomes very easy. These cars are exciting and they are cool and they are fun but they are expensive, but it's easy to go down the justification path of, well, I'm going to spend less on gas and my maintenance is going to be less and I'm going to be saving the earth because I'm not in a combustible engine. At the end of the day, the financial economics of the decision have to still be just as sound. That's right. If you would not go buy, I'll use this example, a $57,000 normal automobile, it might not make sense for you to go buy a $57,000 Tesla. You really have to allow your emotions not to make you make a decision that might not be perfect for you. Word of encouragement though to everybody who's, who's, go pro, who's considering waiting is that, you know, I, I test drove the Model S twice and my, my whole family climbed on and had their way with a Model X that was in the showroom because we're fortunate that there's a showroom um, four or five miles down the street here. Uh, I loved the Model S, but I just could not fathom spending over $100,000 on a car. This car is every bit of 85 to 90 percent of what a Model S and X is. There is no reason to expect that when the lower price version, the $35,000 version, it's still probably going to be 90 percent of this car. So, because Tesla has not shown where they punish you for buying the lesser model. I think it's pretty awesome that they actually still give you a lot of the functionality, a lot of the gadgets, a lot of the creature comforts that you don't get with any other that's car. Right. And that's probably a great way to kind of wrap up the, the purchasing part to let you know that this is a car that is awesome on the, the cost of fun ratio if you make sure you stay in your lane of what you truly can afford. I like that, stay in your lane. Well, I mean, it, it really is those things. If, I'm, if I was at the point, and you said it best, Bo, if you knew you were buying a mid-sized luxury vehicle like a BMW, an Audi, or a Lexus, 
and you, you were thinking in those terms, then a $50,000 car is, is okay. And this thing offers you a lot. I mean, the creature comfort wise, this car has everything that my wife's Audi has. Plus, it's improving with age, sure. which is not something you're seeing with any of the other auto manufacturers. I think they will change their tune on that. Right. But right now, this is the vehicle that is changing and evolving with your driving yep. habits, which is pretty awesome. So let me give you a long story with a short answer. I absolutely love this car. Um, you know, I've had several cars, not a lot of cars, but this by all counts, including some really nice cars between Acura and Audi sure. and Lexus, this has been my favorite car. Um, and maybe it's because I'm a gadget guy, but there is just so much to love about the driving experience, the technology, that this car is going to be revolutionary. And, 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 I, thing, and I think it will change the industry. One thing that I hear you say all the time, Brian, is that there's something that you're so excited to get and the anticipation is half of the fun, then when you buy it, it loses some of its luster. Would you say that now, you know, three weeks, it's still just as exciting? You still love it just as much? It really has made driving fun again. I know that sounds so cliche-ish to say that out sure. loud, but it, it is is one of those things where I get joy from getting to drive this. Now, um, I, I wonder if I'll feel the same way when there's a 200,000 of these just in my city alone, sure, because there sure. are gonna be a lot of these, but I can tell you that I think a lot of people are gonna be very happy with this vehicle. Don't let the little things I pointed out keep you from, from doing this. And don't let the, the thought of being an adopter of a new technology, because innovation is outstanding. And I don't think traditional auto manufacturers are done. I right. think that they're probably, they are already making changes themselves. Yep. So this thing is a win for everybody. Even if you're not a Tesla person, you're gonna love the fact that you get additional technology, additional innovation in your cars. Now remember, this is a unique episode. We're the Money Guy Show. Typically, we're helping you go beyond common sense with your personal finances. We challenge you, if you like this, if you're a person who's never seen any of our content, go check us out, moneyguy.com. You know, we have a lot of content out there on YouTube, as well as on iTunes, Stitcher. There's a lot of ways to connect with us. Please subscribe, please like, please come and check back with us because we, our whole purpose, this is a passion project that was started, just make sure that good information, the good news of financial management was not, not just trapped with people who could afford to get it. It was this whole abundance philosophy that we wanted to make sure that the information was free and then somehow this turned into the greatest idea in the fact that now we work with clients all over the country because I think people can sense that we are unique, that we really do love seeing our Money Guy family be successful. And it has done so much for me and my family. It's done a lot for Bo. Yep. We thank you so much for tuning in and check us out, moneyguy.com. I'm your host, Brian Preston, sitting here with Mr. Bo Hansen. Thank you for checking out my brand new Tesla Model 3.